All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're now in this session going to hear from Mike Roberts and Eric Penner, who are students from the University of Calgary, uh, about medical volume rendering and segmentation. Take it away. So, uh, hi everybody. Just want to say thanks to everybody for coming out today. Um, I'm Eric Penner, from a former student of the Imaging Informatics Lab at the University of Calgary, and I'm presenting with Mike Roberts, who's a master's student at the, also at the Imaging Informatics Lab. And we're going to talk, be talking today about advanced medical volume rendering and segmentation on the GPU. So just to put things in context, the Imaging Informatics Lab is located right in the Foothills, Hospitals in, Ca uh, Foothills Hospital in Calgary. And the lab's focus is really to gather people from several fields in an interdisciplinary environment with the end goal of improving diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring of disease. So today we're going to talk about how we use GPUs to accelerate two important tasks in, medical, in the medical imaging workflow. So I'm going to talk about 3D visualization of medical data and how we optimize this heavily using the GPU and add realiz realism using approximate ambient occlusion and soft shadows. And Mike is going to talk about accelerated volume segmentation, which is a process of identifying and quantifying distinct regions in medical images. So on to talking about uh, volume rendering here. So as a super quick introduction to volume rendering, this diagram illustrates the basics of a naive GPU raycaster. Raycasting just involves taking a volume image and walking each ray through the volume to see what it intersects. The most simple GPU raycaster uses a cube to initialize the entry and ex exit points of rays. Um, and here the entry and exit points are illustrated as colors. The rays are then marched through the volume to find opaque or transparent surfaces. So anytime in volume rendering, uh, you run into something called a transfer function. Transfer function. So because me medical data is usually just one scalar value, we need a transfer function to classify each scalar value as having certain optical properties, like color or opacity. So I was really working towards getting very high image quality volume rendering. And there's a bunch of reasons for good qual uh, image quality. Obviously, we don't want misdiagnosis or other errors resulting from poor images in a clinical setting. However, the image on the left uh, on this slide is the typical image you would find today on many very expensive medical imaging workstations. Another fundal, uh, fundamental reason is that the underlying image quality of the actual SATE, uh, CT scan, for example, is proportional to the amount of radiation administered to get that image. So if we're only using a visualization like this and we're not seeing all of the data in the image, we're really not justifying giving that radiation in the first place. So the goal, uh, just to restate the goal, the goal is to achieve high quality volume rendering and into interactive frame rates. And the approach we took was to design a GPU data structure to accelerate ray casting such that we can afford to do more expensive ray sampling uh, and artifact free volume rendering. So when I started this work, which is actually, this particular work is actually a few years old now, the difference, uh, differences in CPU and GPU architectures, although it hasn't been presented yet, so I think there's still some novel things to mention here, uh, the differences in CPU and GPU architectures had created a sort of dichotomy in uh, rendering algorithms. The recent CPU algorithms have become increasingly elegant and efficient, for example, tracing coherent packets of rays together to amortize the cost of each ray in the packet. In GPU raycasting, the cost of flow control was, of course, already amortized by the GPU. So GPU raycasters were faster than CPU by brute force processing alone. If acceleration structures were used, though, they tended to, be, tended to require heavy CPU, GPU feedback, or sort of clunky proxy geometry. Uh, so what we wanted, of course, was the best of both worlds. We wanted to process as little data as possible, like packet-based ray tracing, while still processing the final selected rays uh, with the brute force of the GPU. So we ended up coming up with a new algorithm that applies the idea of packet-based tracing approaches, but takes advantage of the volumetric nature of our data to make it much more conducive to running on the GPU. And I should mention all of this work was done before texture we could do efficient volume texture sampling in CUDA, but I think there's some really good applications of applying a language like CUDA now that it's more flexible. So our algorithm uses a hybrid of a distance field and an aux tree. So as we can see here, uh, the algorithm sphere tracing 
which uses a distance field, converges very quickly on the surface on the left. And we can adapt sphere tracing actually quite easily to cast packets of rays using a bit of algebra to determine how far each packet can travel. Uh, and this can sort of con conservatively cast many rays at once. However, unfortunately, sphere tracing uh, requires a distance field, but we don't want to compute a distance field every frame because we want to be able to change what we're viewing in the volume at any given time. So to get around this limitation of not having a distance field, we started with another data structure called an octree. And we modded it, modified it to provide a distance just like a distance field. So this is done by adding an overlap to each cell in a min-max octree, such that we always have a minimum distance that we can step from any point that we sample. Um, uh, instead of providing us with the exact distance to the closest surface, uh, like a distance field would, each cell in the octree is either occupied or provides a minimum safe step, step distance. Safe step distance. So the question then becomes, how do we access this modified octree to accelerate ray casting? We could try to traverse the octree, uh, but that would become complicated like a regular octree traversal, which is what we really wanted to avoid. So we wanted a really GPU-friendly algorithm like uh, sphere tracing. So what we found was we could take advantage of the fact that we're moving big groups of rays and base the step size that we need to take on the width of the packet. So for example, if we look at on the right, uh, for a given packet size, if we choose a very tight, uh, an octree level that provides a very tight bound, we can't move very far because we've run into the sides uh, of the sphere very quickly. On the left side, if we choose a very loose octree level that gives us a loose bound, we can take a large potential step, but we also run in, we're also much more likely to run into uh, occluding or visible data on the left or right of the packet. So in the center is kind of an optimal size where we won't run into too much data on the left or right, but we can still take a large step. So basically, we can use this pack, this minimum step size that we want to choose the level in the octree that we want to sample. So as an overview of the algorithm, we start with very large uh, ray packets with very large step sizes, and we refine as we get closer to the data we want to sample. So in this figure, the extremely coarse blue rays represent uh, 256 rays each. So advancing one of these rays is thousands of times faster than advancing each individual ray. And once the blue rays hit visible material, they subdivide into smaller packets, which are illustrated with red, uh, which are 16 rays each. And here, uh, so here the left image illustrates the results from casting those blue rays, and the red, uh, the image with the red border illustrates the results from casting the 16 rays. So it's converging very close to the actual surface at that point. So finally, uh, once we hit, get very close to the surface, we can cast fragment-sized uh, rays that actually do the texture sampling of the final volume. So I won't go too deeply into this, but I've assumed along this, uh, I've assumed so far that we have a fast method to determine if an octree cell is vis has visible material or not. And this basically involves checking if any value in the range of the min-max cell is visible. So in fact, there are a number of existing ways to do this. Uh, so the left shows a pre-calculated 2D visibility lookup you can use, or you can use a 1D summed area table that can also detect if there's any visible material, or we even found a very fast approach was to use a MIP map of the transfer function. And as long as that is actually has a, an alpha value that's completely transparent, it proves um, that there's nothing visible in that cell. So in terms of uh, performance, for opaque isosurfaces where we're just looking for the first hit, we got a very good performance increase consistently of 20 to 30 times speed up over ray casting with a, a uniform step size. For DVR, because uh, one drawback of this, although a lot of other acceleration approaches also have this drawback, um, we couldn't re-merge packets of rays back together. So once rays became divergent into single rays, we had to cast until the end of the volume or until they became opaque. So, um, so basically, if we had something like a shell, we'd still have uh, inefficiency in that case. So this is a case where I think uh, where this algorithm can be significantly improved upon by using a more flexible language like CUDA. And I encourage someone to try that out. 